All right, good to see you guys this morning. If you guys in the foyer want to make your way in, we'll get started. Let's uh, stand and open with a song this morning. Exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted. The King is exalted, and I will praise His name. For He is the Lord forever. His truth shall reign. our screen. I'll give you some announcements. Um, Kids Bible Blast is this week, so starting over at the park, Story Mill Park, um, on Monday at 6 o'clock. So encourage everybody to come. Um, I know it's it's a Kids Bible Blast, but it's it's kind of all hands on deck type of thing. So if you're available to come, there's going to be food there at 6. We're going to Probably burgers tomorrow night, and then I'll figure out what we're doing the next night. But um, yeah, from six o'clock to eight o'clock tomorrow night, please be there. Um, there is an Art of Marriage conference coming up in September. There's a sign up back there in the back. If you are interested in that, sign up for that. And also a ladies' treat coming up at the end of September. So put that on your schedules. And then today, for the Kids Bible Blast, we're going to be put, handing out flyers, well, I guess door hangers. So if you're available to come hang some of these, um, 4 o'clock today, we'll meet here. And then, I don't know, there's still quite a few to, to pass out. Some of us did that yesterday, but in the rain. <laughs> but uh, We attempted to dodge the rain, but, you know. Yeah. So anyways, if you're available at 4 o'clock today, that would be great if you can come in and uh, help out with that. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, even if you could only do it for a little while, every little bit helps. Yep. So anyways, stand up, shake somebody's hand, and let's see if we can get this fixed.
All right, let's continue with some songs this morning while our projector warms up. So this will be a new song for you guys. So hopefully you'll catch on. stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows.
To Jesus every day I find my heart is closer drawn. He's fairer than the glory of the golden purple dawn. He's all my fancy pictures in its fairest dreams and more. Each day he grows to sweeter than he was the day before. The half cannot be fancy. This side the golden shore. Oh, there he'll be so sweeter than he ever was before. His glory broke upon me when I saw him from afar. He's fairer than the lily, brighter than the morning star. He fills and satisfies my longing spirit o'er and o'er. Each day he grows to sweeter than he was the day before. The half cannot be fancy, this side the golden shore. Oh, there he'll be still sweeter than he ever was before. My heart is sometimes heavy, but he comes with sweet relief. He folds me to his bosom when I droop with quiet and grief. I love the Christ who all my burdens in his body bore. Each day he grows to sweeter than he was the day before. The half cannot be fancy. This side the golden shore. Oh, then he'll be still sweeter than he ever was before. The half cannot be fancy. This side the golden shore. Oh, then he'll be still sweeter than. I'm hearing Mary over there clapping. Anybody else wants to clap, feel free. Any expression of, that just spoke to my heart, feel free. I mean, any expression. Realistic expressions. built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name.
Father, Lord, we just thank you for bringing us all here this morning, Lord. Just thank you for hearing these praises that we sang to you. And, Lord, just pray that uh, be with the rest of this morning as Pastor Matt brings us your word. Lord, just open our hearts and ears to your word and and uh, just touch each and every one of us. Lord, we thank you for your son. In his name we pray. Amen. on now okay he's back there like come on dad you're not on um yeah for those who are visitors that's my son that's my son my son just walked out that's my daughter my daughter just walked out i have two other sons who are not here so anyway uh yeah we have seven kids i remember we lived in uganda for 16 years and during that time when we'd tell people they'd ask us well how many children do you have and uh we'd tell them seven and they're like, what? Wow. You, you know, and, and in Uganda, they say produce. They don't just say you give birth to or had kids. You know, you just say you produce so many children. We say, you know, we, we produce seven kids. Like, oh, wow, you produce like us. And the next inevitable question was always one woman, one wife, because polygamy is fairly normal over there. And I'm like, yes, one wife. <laughs> oh, well, we can give you another one. I'm like, no, thank you. Um, so anyway, that was free, no charge for that. Uh, so yeah, uh, again this afternoon, so we'll have our meeting after church, those who are involved in the Kids Bible Blast be there, and again this afternoon, I don't know if, the, if Jeremy showed these, but this is what we're handing out, we're putting these, we're handing out, we're putting these on a uh, door, and just going up to a door, we're not knocking, nothing, just hanging them on doors and running, and uh, so if you could help hand out like 40 or 50 of these. We've got it broken down into about a segment of 40 or 50, and, you know, it's, it's 45 minutes of walk-in, you know, 50 at the most, or I mean, um, an hour at the most for you, 
and just going through that segment. If you can nail that segment, that's great. And if you know kids around you in your neighborhood, um, you know, please take a few. They're out there uh, by the door, and you know, take a few when you leave. Take uh, take what you'll use. But you know, we're doing this tomorrow, so we need to get these out. And um, by the way, that so I could brag on her with her here. Um, but uh, anyway, she is, she is with uh, Steve and Judy being very spiritual this week. So <laughs> they're camping. Uh, anyway, but she filled out the permission form in triplicate, handed it in in time, so I approved it. Stamped it. No. Anyway, uh, but I mean, she is awesome. She did great. So, you know, you see her, next time you see her, just tell her, hey, great job on that design because she really did an awesome job on that. Okay, um, and please, if you tomorrow, beginning tomorrow, if you are not able this week to come out for whatever reason, would you please do this for us? Keep us in your prayers. Um, it's, it's a busy week. Those who have done VBS, you know it's a busy week. We've got a different format that we're doing this in, uh, in that we're doing it in the park, so we don't have the nice controlled confines of a church auditorium, which would really be convenient. Um, but we're doing it out there for a couple reasons. One, it's kind of tough to do games in here, although we could create games. You know, there are indoor games that can be done. But the main purpose was to get exposure. We want to be out where people will see us. We want to be able to just go around and invite people who are already going to be in the park that night who don't even know we're doing this. And in the park, we're kind of hoping parents will just kind of hang around while we're uh, playing games with their kids and doing crafts and teaching them Bible story. And, and so, we're again, we're just going to have people who are going to walk around and just talk to people. Just, you know, and if you can just walk around and talk to people, small conversation with them even, I mean, just, uh, and just saying hi and all that stuff, that's huge. That's, again, everybody, there, there's a place for everyone. But if you can't come, please keep us in your prayers uh, all week because uh, it's going to be busy. And, and I don't know about, you know, the rest of you who are getting ready. I'm a little nervous. Um, and it's just like, you know, oh, I wish, you know. Anyway, just it's one of those things. We're going to do the best we can. Get ready for it and go do it. Okay, um, let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. We are continuing in our series on becoming a disciple-making church. Our Lord commissioned us, Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16, Luke 24, Acts chapter 1. He commissioned his church to be, to have a purpose that you know, we would go and win souls, we would incorporate those believers, new believers through baptism, uh, getting them involved in the church, and then disciple them so that they grow up and we grow up together in the truth of Christ. And so... With all of that, uh, we're continuing through all of this as we work to bring that culture into this church. Last week, I specified that really the changes that we are working to implement are not so much methodological changes. We've had small groups before. We're going to do small groups again. It's not about that. It's about when we do these things, what is our mindset? And the mindset change is this. I am not coming to church, I'm not going to my small group, just so that I can consume, so that I can get, because again, we, we need fellowship, but often the fellowship's about me and my friends, uh, and Monday, and go share with someone, hey, this is what our pastor talked about when I get to work, okay? Um, and, and different things, you know, we come for the worship, and it's good, but look, any of that fellowship, getting the word and worship outside of the context of the Great Commission ultimately is an internal focus and when the church is focused internally and individuals are focused internally what happens is the church just goes into a slow fade and, and just gets into the, that's when you get into a rut that's when church gets boring because we're not doing what God's called us to do 2 Timothy 2 2 it's kind of a theme verse that we keep going through, and we've gone through it, keep going through it all summer. Paul said to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 2, Timothy, and the things that thou hast, the things that you have learned from me, 
those same things commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I have invested in you. You now invest into others who are faithful people. So there's, a, there's a, some requirements here, faithful people, who will then take what you have given them and invest in others. Beginning today, I want to start talking about the power of influence. And this is part one. And sorry, I don't have it on the screen today. Uh, probably won't have it on the screen next week either after going through <clears throat> a week of uh, Kids Bible Blast. So, um, you know my week has been busy when there's nothing on the screen. Forgive me for that. That's just kind of the reality of being a bivocational pastor. Um, so, and by the way, yet at the same time, as I'm out there, you know, even just uh, Friday, the job that I did, actually both Thursday and Friday, the people I'm working with, getting opportunities to just talk to them. I was up in Big Sky and uh, working with the guy, you know, the owner of the house there and just talking to him and just little bits at a time, just laying, just talking about God and churches a little bit, just throwing it out there and just kind of seeing where it goes. That's what we do. Friday as I was at work painting the house over in Livingston and, uh, and the property manager invited her and her husband to come to the Art of Marriage. And by the way, let me plug real quick for the Art of Marriage, okay? Art of Marriage Conference, if you've heard of Family Life, and they do, uh, they, and we've been to it before. Last year we went to one of their activities. It was over in Coeur d'Alene. Weekend to remember, thank you. I was like, my, I looked at my wife and she's already tracking with me. I'm, it's gone out of my brain. Weekend to remember, and they put that on all over the country. And just phenomenal. But we're doing what is called the art of marriage, and it's, it's also something of theirs. Look, if your marriage just needs, let me use it, you know, car illustrations. If your marriage just needs maintenance, you need an oil change. Great, come on in. Okay, maybe your marriage is actually doing pretty good. You got the oil change done. You know, Harrison's back there loving all this. All right, <clears throat> uh, our mechanic back there. Yeah, you got the oil change. You're good on the maintenance. You just want to, you know, like shine up the paint a little bit, you know, and give it a good polish. All right, great. That's good for you, too. Maybe you've got some serious servicing that needs to be done. Something's broken. Or maybe you need a whole engine overhaul. Okay. Wherever your marriage is, plan on coming. Okay. And uh, it's going to be a Friday afternoon, so you can, you can work Friday morning after lunch. Just get it off. Or if you absolutely can't find, rush in here later, but you're going to miss the first session. Um, and... Uh, but, you know, it's going to be Friday afternoon and Saturday and um, all day Saturday. And I just encourage you, uh, those who are married, those who are planning to get married, uh, and uh, just be there. Plan that. But So I, I invited her to come. And so many opportunities. Look, we all have opportunities to meet people and extend the grace of God to them. And that's the mentality that needs to be brought in is whether it is people outside of this room, whether it is people in this room, we should always come with a mentality, and that's what needs to change. The mentality of I'm not, for example, Sunday morning, I'm not coming into this room just to sit down. You come in, get your radar on, and I'm speaking to the members here, get your radar on and say, who can I be a blessing to today? Who could I bring under wing and pour into them maybe even help to disciple that person. And this is, if, when this mentality gets into this, this body, we will see this body thrive. And it's going to be an exciting place to be in. Can I get an amen? Thank you. Okay. Um, so let's do that. Genesis chapter 18, though. I want to go to the very first mentoring relationship that I can find in the Bible today. And in the next three weeks, uh, I'm going to be going through mentoring relationships. Next Sunday, by the way, next Sunday, what was it? Uh, could you just very quickly tell us exactly what? Sunday school, uh, I've, uh, I've asked uh, Kevin to do our Sunday school next week, and he's got this uh, thing that he's going through. Very quickly, 30 seconds Tell us all what, what that is. 
yeah, you, get, you just jump in the middle of service. You know me, I don't care. All right. Thank you, Kevin. So that'll be next Sunday morning, 10 o'clock uh, before the main service. Please be there. Uh, don't miss out on that. So so we're, we see here, as I look through Scripture, and I look at, I was, I'm going to start going through discipling, mentoring relationships in the Bible. And, and the first one I saw was, was this one. It was actually Abraham. And whether it was an intentional relationship or not, it was a relationship that there was mentoring going on, and I wanted. And I, as I went through here, I found certain things about this that were very insightful. But in Genesis eighteen verses sixteen through nineteen, God opens up our understanding here of why Abraham was so big to him. Because you got to think, the Bible records the book of Genesis, fifty chapters in the book of Genesis. Twenty five of them are dedicated to this man's life. And so why? Why did God put so much focus on Abraham? And he says here, the men arose from there and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Now, now catch what he says in verse 19. For I have known him in order to that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Notice what our Lord said here. I am investing into this man because he is going to command or charge his children, not just his children, but his household, Household in that day meant those who were working for you, the servants. And the servants were more like extended family in, in, this, in this culture of a, that Abraham was in. And he says, I know that Abraham is going to invest. He is going to mentor those who are under his responsibility, whether they are immediate family or whether they are those who are working with him. And this is why God had such a great interest in this man. He was a man of faith, meaning God could say something and Abraham would do it or Abraham would believe it. But, not, but that wasn't enough. It was the fact that this man who would do what God said to do and would believe what God said would then pass that on to those who were under his influence. And so personally, as we look at this relationship between Abraham and and his oldest servant, Eleazar. Yeah, some could argue that maybe oh, it wasn't intentional, but as I see what the Lord says about Abraham here, I believe there was some definite intentionality by Abraham. Because God has exposed Abraham's heart and what God wanted to do through Abraham here. And Abraham intentionally invested in this man, Eleazar. And so... Let's pray and let's just let's dig into this. Father, I pray for your guidance this morning. I pray for your wisdom. I pray that your word would be clear and that, your, of course, by your spirit it would be made clear. I pray you would help me uh, to ex uh, express what this is saying, and I ask that you would open the hearts of each person here. Father, you have not called us to live private, isolated 
Christian lives, but you have called us to be people walk with you as well. And by doing so, we expand, we multiply the ministry that you've called us all to be a part of. So do your work here, I pray this morning. Give us understanding in this text. We pray in Christ's name, amen. There's a fella in Uganda who became very uh, dear to me. Uh, his name was Kennedy. It was interesting. He, that's not his birth name. His birth name, I, I don't even know what his birth name is, but he had changed his name uh, when he was a teenager. He calls himself Kennedy Lancelot. I'm like, seriously, Lancelot? And this is an African. This guy, is, he's a Ugandan by birth, okay? Kennedy Lancelot, that is his registered official name. And so I met this guy when I first met him, and he was uh, late teens, early 20s when I met him. And uh, he was kind of in an, uh, an affluent part of our town. And, and, and so, you know, they lived in a nice house compared to most people. And, of course, that's all subjective uh, or relative. And, uh, but he, you know, he was very well educated. I mean, he had some of the clearest English, uh, well, to a point. Sometimes he would speak, and my wife's like, I can't even understand him. But he had this, this different accent. I don't know. I, it was kind of a mix of British and El Anyway, but things, and, and, and I would just listen to him, and he'd talk, and, and, and I remember one time he told me that uh, we were, you know, that he doesn't believe that women go to heaven. You know, God, God doesn't let women go to heaven. Women just, when they die, they're just going to kind of float in space. And I was <laughs> like, what? Where did you get that from? And uh, just some really wild thoughts. And, and so, <clears throat> but I just would share Christ with him, and we'd talk. Then I lost track of Kennedy for, I don't know if it was a year or two or something, but some time went by. And then one day he showed back up in our town and uh, came to church and he, he called me and I forget exactly what all transpired from there, but he, he came to tell me, Matt, I've received Christ. And the guy completely changed. By the way, his view on women corrected too. <laughs> and... Um, <clears throat> and but it was just so, it was wonderful listening to him talk about how, you know, he'd been in numerous churches that were also teaching some strange stuff. And he was like, man, I was in those places. The word of God was not being taught. It was all health, wealth, prosperity stuff. And, but it, it was, I realized this was a desert. I'm drying up. And he said, I finally turned to Christ. And <clears throat> now that I'm here and I'm, I'm in this church and I'm hearing the word of God, just faithfully preached every week, I feel like a man who's just come to a river, I've come out of the desert, I've come to a river of just this crystal clear water, and I'm diving in, and I'm opening my mouth, and I'm just drinking it all up. And, and Kennedy just became a, a spark plug in our church. And, and, and I took him personally and took him under my wing, and, and we would meet once a week, and we'd go through uh, some of the discipleship stuff and, uh, that we had and just teaching him the Bible, and, and, and we'd have him over to my house a lot. And just Kennedy and I became very close friends. In time, Kennedy became our, our director in our church for evangelism and, and just really just serving the Lord. Eventually, he did leave our church and, and got married and moved to the capital city. And, but he even there served in a church of a fellow missionary uh, and was active in that church for a time. And, and, just every, and he would call me all the way up until we left Uganda two years ago. He would call me out of the blue and say, hey, Brother Matt, how you doing? Haven't heard from you for a while. And uh, and we talked for a while, and it was just great seeing how God just worked in his life. That's the beauty of mentorship and discipleship. And when you look at Scripture, the principle of discipleship, mentorship, companionship, these forms of relationships are actually an eternal pr principle. God's people were never designed by God, to ever walk through life alone. It's just not healthy at all. From the very beginning, when God created Adam, on day number one of Adam's life, which is day six of creation, God told Adam, I want you to name all the animals, and doing so, he realized he was lonely, and God created the first woman and created the first marriage. And, and, and immediately from the beginning, companionship was a part and a part of the design of God's creation of man. As you continue 
Parents, of course, it was natural for them to guide their children. Uh, this is as basic as a father teaching his son how to shoot basketball or to use a hammer. And the structure of the passing on would persist and, and the patriarchal system of a father and his family and extended family even, that patriarchal system would, would continue up to the flood and even beyond the flood. And through that, it was just natural for in that patriarchal system for there to be a mentoring type of setup in the home and in the extended home and throughout the clan. As you come to the after the flood, human government is established. As human government is getting its beginnings, of course, the patriarchal system was already well established. And so Noah and his sons continue the patriarchal system, but government starts growing. And, and, and as they started, the influence and authority of the two, uh, this one would wane and this one would increase until authority of government would become greater than the authority of the home as far as the overall power in society. What you see is a change of this mentorship concept from just being within the family to extending beyond the family. Why? Because family units started suffering, and it doesn't mean that they never suffered before the flood. I'm sure they did, and we know they did. But the fact is, as you, you see uh, this form of authority raising up and civilizations not just being a family and a clan-centered civilization and culture, now it's just society. We are of this group of people. Uh, we may not even be part of the, of, a, of the same family, but we all live in the same town. We have a governor over us, and that the family system started breaking down as towns started being developed. And with that, then, you get people growing up, and they, they don't have actual natural family mentorship happening. And so it was natural, then, that they would be taken under wing by others and brought in as if they were a family member, and there was investment being made. And this is what Abraham did with Eleazar. This is the first recorded, as I said, the first recorded non-family membership relationship where there, it, there is this mentorship thing going on. And, and you first see it in Genesis 15 when Abraham prays to God and he says, God, you promised me an heir. But here I am, many years later, I don't have an heir. But this one, Eleazar who is the firstborn in, within my home, even though it was to one of the servants, but he's firstborn within the home, he, according to my culture, would be my heir. God, why don't you just accept him as the heir? By the way, this shows you the dynamic of the master-servant relationship there. It was not, when you think of this dynamic, don't think of, uh, of classic American or European uh, or uh, uh, slavery. It was not that, because... In this scenario, one born in his house, this one who was a servant, uh, that one could become his heir. And that would never happen in the dynamic of slavery that we are familiar with. So it was more of a, again, this family type unit, and you worked for this particular individual, but it was very close knit, so a very close knit society. He said, God, Take this guy, Eleazar, he's, he's first born, and, and, and I know him, and, and he could be my heir. And God said, no, 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 the heir of promise, he will be uh, someone born of your loins. But this man was very special, and we see him again the next time. We, this is the only mention directly of his name. And, but we see later in chapter 24, and we're going to come to this story, in chapter 24, where Abraham sends out a servant. And this is one of the longest chapters in, in all of Genesis. He sends out a servant to go find a wife for his son Isaac. And the servant is never named. But when you look at just the fact that Eleazar is the firstborn in the home, and, and he was considered to be the heir, who would Abraham choose to do such a great task as to go find a wife for his son? Who would you entrust that to? And so because of this and because of the culture and all the things, and I'm not going to go into all of that, I just want to bring this. Uh, I personally believe that this is still Eleazar. Uh, my study Bible is MacArthur's study Bible. MacArthur believes it is Eleazar. 
Uh, you can Google this, and I was looking through some articles, Jewish, uh, or Jewish articles uh, online. They all agree unanimously that they believe this is Eleazar. So it's most likely that when you come to chapter 24, and Abraham sends this nameless servant to go out, that this is Eleazar. This is someone who Abraham has had great influence on. And again, if it is not Eleazar, that's fine. Either way, the person he sent was someone who Abraham had great influence upon and had affected the way that this man works. But for the sake of today, we're gonna, I'm going to take and move forward and look at him as this man, Eleazar. But it was common then... Uh, I mean, I want to just, so let's move forward in this. Let me just leave that. I'm going to move forward. Let's look at some lessons from Abraham's influence over this man, Eleazar. And we're going to look, first of all, at the fact that observation, even if, Mos, even if Abraham never sat down with this guy and said, all right, here, here, and here, this is how, you know, life needs to work. Even if he didn't do that, Eleazar observed Abraham and observation alone was developmental. Just watching Abraham helped Eleazar to develop. In Genesis chapter 15, that's again when we see that first uh, mention of him. And again, just look at the way Abraham talks about this guy. Genesis 15 verses 2 and 3, but Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And so just, you see, he's, he, he's got no problem looking at him and saying, Look, I don't have a child, but this guy, he's a great guy. He's my heir. He's the first, born, uh, first one born in my house. And, and there was this connection already at this time with this man, Eleazar. And so I want to be, just begin with this. Even though there is no direct mention of intentionality, with the exception of chapter 18, which I read to you, where the Lord said you, he will invest in his family and with those within his household, and that would include Eleazar. This master-servant relationship gave countless opportunities for Eleazar to observe how Abraham dealt with life. Look at some of the background of this man, okay? And some of the background is, it, Scripture doesn't give us any background, but if you go to Jewish history and tradition, uh, again, a couple of the websites that I looked at, they were both in agreement on some of these things. So it's just kind of interesting, some thoughts, again, not straight out of Scripture, but from Jewish tradition. Uh, first of all, Eleazar was possibly, they say that he's from the uh, family of Nimrod, if you guys remember the Tower of Babel and Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, uh, Jewish tradition says that he was from that family. He would have been from a royal family. And, uh, but if you'll remember as well, uh, Nimrod, I mean, his, his kingdom was Babel, and Babel had actually rejected God's authority, which is why God brought, uh, confused the languages and made them all split up. And so most likely, Eleazar is growing up in this household, in this clan, and God is a fact of life. People would have talked about God openly. They would have talked about the flood. All of that would have been common knowledge. He might have even known Noah himself. You've got to remember, Noah lived to be 950 years, which meant he lived 350 years after the flood. And so... There's a lot of influence. This man would have been a religious person and knowing a lot about God, but very unlikely that he would have personally known God. And so now Abraham brings this guy into his household, and, and this man is in his household, and this is in chapter 15, Abraham saying to God, God, why couldn't he be my heir? And if you know chapter 15, it's later on in chapter 15, or God goes through chapter 15, and God says, Abraham, I want you to trust me. I'm going to give you a son. From the deadness of your womb, from the deadness, I'm sorry, from the deadness of your wife's womb, I am going to, out of death, bring life. And this is where he told Abraham, Abraham, look at the stars. And 
count the stars. And Abraham's going, you can't. This is impossible. And God says, bingo. Yet I can name, I know every one of them by name. See, what is impossible with you is possible with me. I can bring life out of death. Abraham, do you believe that? And the Bible says that Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. This is Abraham's point of conversion. You know, up to this point, it's amazing. Abraham took steps of faith, and he had not yet been fully converted. He had not yet received the one true God as his only God and put his faith in God. You know, and it is interesting. You know, people can take steps. People can take good steps towards God before they ever know him personally. And what that is, is that is God showing, I'm doing a work in that life. And so, but here's what you need to see is this means Eleazar was in Abraham's home before Abraham was fully converted. Abraham was convinced a lot about God. He was definitely, I mean, enough to say, all right, all right, whoever you are, God, I'll, I'll follow you. Um, and so he saw him before then, and he also, Eleazar, saw Abraham after he was converted as well. He got to see the, the before and after. And undoubtedly, he, he got to see some things that affected him. Some of the experiences that he would have had with Abraham. If you look at chapter 14, Lot, Abraham's nephew, he was in Sodom, and these kings had come and, and conquered Sodom, took the people of Sodom, took Lot with him, and now Lot was captive to these kings. And if you remember the story, Abraham led his men, 318 uh, 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 of his servants, which shows you, by the way, the wealth of Abraham, 318 of his servants, he takes these men out uh, to battle against these kings, wins the victory, brings Lot back. Eleazar would have been there. Eleazar would have been a part of that. He would have seen this. He would have seen Abraham, when they come back, giving devotion to Melchizedek, the man who was the king and priest of Salem, which the book of Hebrews makes very clear, was God in a pre-incarnate, Christ in a pre-incarnate form. And... Uh, and he saw that devotion to this one, and that affected him. He watched Abraham struggle and trust God with this promise that God would make of him a great nation and give him an heir. And can you imagine watching Abraham making this, okay, God, you're going to give me an heir, okay, maybe it's Eleazar. And maybe Eleazar is kind of assuming he is the heir, and maybe there's talk going around. And he's thinking, wow, this is kind of cool. I'm, I'm, I could be the heir to all this. And he saw Abraham at, have, you know, trust God and say, no, God says it's going to be a child born of my wife, a natural child. And he saw the mistake with Hagar. He saw all the mistakes that Abraham made, but he saw that Abraham, he'd make a mistake and be like, okay, God, I blew it. Help me out here. Help me trust you. And he saw this. He saw the real life of Abraham, firsthand witness to this. And though, again, it doesn't seem when, when uh, when you look at uh, chapter 22, when Abraham took Isaac, God told Abraham, take your son Isaac, the heir who I promised you, and you go take him, and you offer him for a sacrifice. I want you to take that son and sacrifice him. Eleazar, I don't know, when I look at the, the Hebrew word here, it's a word for young man. Abraham would have been midlife by this time or older. <clears throat> and so it's very possible he was not one of the men who went with him to Mount Moriah where he sacrificed or, where he was supposed to sacrifice Isaac, but he would have been, he would have known. Maybe he was left behind and Abraham, you know, told him what God said that he was supposed to do. And he just shook his head. Abraham, I used to, I, I'm just kind of picturing, if you can imagine with me, the conversation here. Abraham, this is the heir that God promised you. This is the guy who took my place. <laughs> and God's now telling you to sacrifice him? Really? What is this? And I, maybe there's an argument going on. Maybe there's, he's, there's doubt and there's question in his mind. There had to be some of that going on. And, and maybe Abraham says to him, Eleazar, stay here. Watch my home. I'll be back. I'll be back. And he's gone for a few days, a week or two, while they go on this journey. 
And then he sees Abraham come back with Isaac. Whoa, whoa, whoa. what happened? I got to know. And Abraham gets to tell him, God never wanted Isaac. He just wanted to show me something. And he provided it. When, when Abraham, in his relation, when, when he opened up his house, and, and again, that was the culture of that day. You were part of the home. You were part of the clan, even though you weren't a family member. And so you got to observe and be a part of things that were going on. Just day-to-day life was a mentorship experience. This is a part of our culture that we have got to learn to overcome. Our culture teaches us that, no, we close off. No, you have your home, and it's to be closed only to those who are special and friends. And and outside of that group, don't let anybody in. That's what our culture says. It's unhealthy, folks. God wants us to open up because when we open up and we say, hey, would you come in? Hey, would you come in? What happens is they get to observe your life. You say, but my house isn't always clean. Yeah, I know, I get it. Um, we got a dog that's been peeing on our carpet downstairs, and we finally had to put a gate up on the top of the staircase just to keep the stupid dog out of there. Can't get her to stop. And so, I mean, I, I'm telling Sharon, I'm like, it just doesn't smell good down there. All right, so <clears throat> those coming over to my house, please forgive me, but if you smell that, I'm sorry. We're trying to work on it. The gate's up. But look, here's what they see. They see a real person in real life scenarios, working through life. And as they watch you do that, you're helping to develop who they are. And you get to be a part of helping them walk with Christ as you respond in the hard things and the difficult things and in the fun things in a Christ-like way. And even when you mess up but then make it right, you influence that person. And so... Just through observation, Abraham, or Eleazar, was being developed into the man that God wanted him to be. There are three areas where he was being developed. As I look at this, I see this, and especially if we go to chapter 24, and let's go there. <clears throat> Again, I'm just going to continue considering that this is Eleazar. Again, even if I'm wrong, the principles are here, though. Three things that I see that were developed in him. One, there was trust. Trust between Abraham to, Abraham to Eleazar and even Eleazar to Abraham. Which, number two, resulted in a loyalty. Loyalty was developed. And number three, faith was developed. Number one, trust. So Abraham, his son Isaac now, the promised heir, is 40 years old. <clears throat> and God... I mean, Abraham knows uh, that he's old, and he needs to get a wife for his son. And it was a common thing in that day for the father to arrange the marriage. And so he called his trust, most trusted servant. And when you read this, it says here, Now Abraham, chapter 24, verse 1, Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, which is why we conclude this is Eleazar, because remember, chapter 15, he was the firstborn servant in his house. So we conclude that. He was the oldest servant in his house who ruled over all that Abraham had. And again, that shows you the dynamic of this relationship, though it's a a master-servant relationship. It was not a demeaning relationship in any way. This man had rule over, he was was the steward over Abraham's house. This is a high and and, and honorable position. And, And in no way did this man feel like he was under terrible subjugation. And so we continue, uh, verse uh, verse 2, the end there. He says to this man, please put your hand under my thigh. And I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son, Isaac. By the way, side note, notice it was important to Abraham what type of woman his son was to marry. Be careful, you 
people, young people, and even parents, you know, in, in encouraging your children, you know, encourage them in getting into right relationships. Very important. Or if you're considering a relationship, you've got to stop and consider, is this person, you know, I want to follow God. Does this person want to follow God? Does this person know God? It's very important. But anyway, so he calls this man and he says, I want you to swear to me. And he does this thing, you know, put your hand under my thigh. And, and so, he, you know, he does that. And that was an old cultural thing there. You're putting your hand in kind of an intimate area. <clears throat> but it's saying, look, I'm letting you in on what's going on in our life. And I'm trusting you to get this done and to do it right. A lot of trust here. And the Bible says that as, as they discussed all of this, verse 10, that the servant then took ten of, his master's, uh, ten of his master's camels and departed, for all his master's goods were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. Notice, first of all, Abraham trusted him to fulfill a great task. Now, obviously, this was not the first task that Eleazar had ever been given by Abraham. That's just a given. You, you know, the Bible says that whoever is faithful in little will be faithful in much. But if you are not faithful in that which is little, maybe, you know, I come to you and I say, hey, could you help us out in this? And I give you something small, and you're like, well, I should be doing something better. I should be doing bigger things in this church. You know what? If you're not faithful in the small, God tells me that you're not going to be faithful in that bigger area of, of responsibility. And, uh, but Abraham had trusted him at times. And it built up to this point where he could trust him in the biggest thing he could ever give someone, finding a wife for his son, his only son. Or at least the only son from his wife. And so, you know, when someone is, when you're mentoring someone, you're not just mentoring someone so that you can just pour information in them. You are mentoring that person so that you can trust them to go out and serve. You're not always holding the responsibility. You know, one of the problems that pastors have is we love hanging on to responsibility and everything, and we don't like to dish out responsibility. But that's what, that's what we need to be doing. As you're mentoring someone and pouring into someone, there's got to be a point where you say, you know what, I trust you. And Abraham trusted this man to steward his belongings. And this point of mentoring is to pass on when you know, I'm sorry, the point of mentoring is to pass on what you know. We need to pass on what we know so that they can do, the people we're mentoring can do what we do. We need to pass on what we know so that those we are mentoring can do what we do. And Eleazar, as he traveled there, he trusted Abraham in all of this. He trusted that Abraham was following God. Again, you've got to think, this man, this man would have been the heir. This man would have been the one who inherited all of Abraham's riches. But then that's, that little kid was finally born. Abraham was 100 years old. He should not have had a kid, and he was born. You know, I kind of wonder if Eleazar maybe struggled with that a little bit at the beginning. But either way, whether he did or didn't, the fact is, by the time you come to chapter 20, 24 here, and he is sent on this journey, this man had developed a loyalty for Abraham. Abraham had developed a trust, and these two had a trust. But number two, there was a loyalty that was developed. And we see this loyalty not in just the fact that he went and he said, all right, I'll do this, but we see this loyalty in the fact that there was urgency in what he did. Look at, look at verse 33. All right, as we come to verse 33, Eleazar has traveled now, back to Abraham's family, and as he is, he's there, and that's a long journey, by the way. It's not just over the hill to Livingston. Okay, we're talking about traveling by camel from here to Minneapolis. Okay, 
rough estimate, but uh, off the top of my head, so that's I didn't measure that out. But I mean, it's it's, it's long. Let's say at least from here to Pierre, South Dakota, or Bismarck. I mean, it's just by camel. And so he's traveled there. He gets there, and he didn't just get there and just hang out and say, man, I'm going to take a break. He gets there and immediately starts praying and says, God, I need you to bless this journey. God brings Rebecca out. He meets her, and he, he's like, wow, is this a woman? And, and it seems like God's in this. And he gets to her house. She invites him. He, he says, can I meet your, your home? And she says, yeah, come on home. And she takes him home. They meet the family, and, and Elliot, the family says, oh, sit down, have food, and all of this. And he says, hold on, no, 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 verse 33. Food was set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told about my errand. And he said to her father, speak on, tell us what's, what's going on. He said, I'm not eating. We've got, I've been sent here for this. We're dealing with this. I mean, just this sense of urgency. You think, I mean, the guy's traveled all this way. What's the big deal about just sitting down and having a meal first? No, he's like, no, no, I've got to get this taken care of. Let's deal with this first. And he expressed that urgency. Look, how is this going to benefit the man? He's finding a wife for his boss's son who took his place as heir and... How's he, how's he going to benefit from this? Because the fact is, the son you know, has a wife, now the son's going to have kids, and I mean, you know, at least if the son were to die, maybe now he becomes the heir again. <laughs> but he's going to have kids, and there's, you know, this is all said and done for him. It's, it's, it's over. He's got, he's, he really, he has nothing to gain from this, but he comes with this loyalty, with this urgency, saying, I am here not for myself, but for my master. And not only that, but this is really interesting. Look at the loyalty. It extends beyond Abraham. He brings Rebecca. So Rebecca uh, says, yeah, I want to go with him. The family says, yeah, take our daughter. We see this is good. God's in this. He returns back with her. As they're coming, look what it says. Uh, verse 64. Then Rebecca lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel. For she had said to the servant, who is this man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, it is my master. So she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Wait, the person coming was not Abraham. The person coming was Isaac. And he called Isaac his master even. That's my boss. That's some serious loyalty. What developed him in, in him? Trust. What was developed? Loyalty. Final thing here. Faith was developed, and this is the most important thing. See, this man saw, as he watched Abraham, and I don't have time to go all through all this, but he saw Abraham and that his faith and his God was real, and he watched this year after year after year. For 25 years, he watched this until finally Abraham had his son. And then another 40 years now until he is sent to go and find a wife for that son. For 65 years... He's watched Abraham. Sure, Abraham's blown it a few times, but he cannot deny that man's faith is the real thing. And it affected him. You've got to ask yourself, when people see you, when they see the way that you are about your relationship with God, is it real? Or do they look at your walk with God and just say, eh, if that's what that is, I'm really not interested. They may deny others. They may even deny here and you now. Uh, they, they might say, no, I'm not even going to church. But they should not be able to look at you and say, I never saw that your faith was real to you. They should actually have to say, no, I'm not coming to church. But I did see, yeah, it's real with you. And they can't deny it. And that type of thing frustrates people like that because it was real. They're denying it, but they couldn't help but see it was real with you. And Eleazar saw over 65 years this was real. The Bible says, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7, the righteous man walks in his integrity. Integrity means you're not putting on a show. You're the real thing. And when you do that, your children are blessed after you or 
in this case, those who you are influencing. Here's where we see the faith of Abraham and that it had become real in the life of Eleazar. When you come to verse 12, go back to verse 12 in chapter 24. Then he, Eleazar, said, Oh, Lord God. So he's there. He's at, the, he's at this well. He just finished the trip. He's in the right place. And look at the prayer. He says, Oh, Lord God, of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. And he, what, a, what a great prayer. He says, God, here's what I want to do. If you would just do this, I'll take it as a sign from you. Notice, who does he have to impress here? He's nowhere around Abraham. He's nowhere around Isaac. Sure, there are other servants around, but he's just sitting down by the well, most likely sitting by himself. And even if he's not, he's, got, he's not there. To, there's nobody to impress. And here he is, just him and God. And they're having a conversation. You know, if God's not real to you, you don't do that. You don't talk to God when you're alone. Or when the people you want to impress are not around. Anybody can talk to God when there's someone to impress. And you put on a show. This guy, there was nobody to put on a show for. It was real. Where did that come from? It came from seeing Abraham over and over again. And for Eleazar, he said, he realized, he's, he's God. This truly is God. And he came to accept the God of Abraham, as his own God. A lot more I could say about that, but let me just wrap this up here. Again, I just wonder, when people look at our lives, they might not accept and, and everything that we try to show them, even as you mentor people or even in your homes. They might not accept it, but... Is there such a reality in your faith and your walk with Christ that they cannot deny that for sure it's real and it's true? And if those, if those people would openly say, okay, I'm going to watch you. I want to see if this is, I, I want to see, I, I see it's real. I want to know more. Can they watch your life and learn the truth about their creator and about Christ who died for them? Look, that's, again, that's the whole point of all of this. We want to be the type of people who our lives affect and influence others, and they can see us, and when we speak, they know it's genuine. We're not putting on a show, and we can then share the love of Christ. We can then share that there's a hope in this broken world and that it's in the one who died on the cross for their sins. Eleazar saw that, and it was real. Let me finish with this. There's a guy... I'm taking a class right now um, and uh, working on a master's in this class on discipleship in, in my particular course. Uh, it's being taught by a game, guy named Brian Sams, now Dr. Brian Sams. I first met Brian Sams 25 years ago when I traveled as a youth evangelist. We were there during the same summer training together. And at that time, He was just another college student who was serving the Lord in the summer. Now, he's my professor, Dr. Brian Sams. And it's just just amazing watching what God has done through this guy and how God is working in him. And there's no question why God was able to use him in such a great way. Because when you listen to Brian's testimony... When he got saved, and from what I understand, out of a lost home, and God was not a part of his home growing up. When he got saved, his pastor who led him to the Lord then told him, Brian, come with me. I want you to hang out with me. I want you to observe. I want to help develop you. And Brian got to watch and see his pastor day in and day out, and he saw this is real. And it affected him, and it set him up to do great things for God. And I just want to ask you, are, are you the type of person who wants to just sit back and come to the end of your Christian life and know that you were faithful in going to church every Sunday? <laughs> Amen. 
Or do you want to be the type of person who you come to the end of your life, you can look and say, praise God, I got to influence that one. And I got to influence that one. And I got to influence that one. Oh, and that one, and that one. And God did a great work, and this is so amazing. We have a choice to make. Will we influence or not? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this message here of Eleazar and the way that you used Abraham to work in his life. Father, do that work in our lives. I pray that you would help each person here to really examine themselves of whether or not they will be an influential factor in others. But I do pray, Lord, first of all, for those who don't know Christ. Just like Eleazar, he, he had to watch Abraham and see, man, there's something different about this guy. He's not like the idol worshipers uh, or the people who I, I used to know who they acknowledge God, but they didn't know him. Abraham's different. And I just pray for that person that who might be here who knows about you but doesn't know you personally. And I pray for their salvation. I pray for those who are your people. That again, Father, that we would not just be faithful in coming to church, but we would be faithful in investing in the lives of others. And that we can stand before you and rejoice that we have been able to be obedient and disciple and mentor others to walk with you. Right now, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, number one, if you don't know Christ, that's the whole point of all of this. Eleazar needed to know the one true God. What about you? Eleazar saw him in Abraham. And we're presenting him to you here this morning. I have not spoken much about Christ this morning directly. But he is your creator. He is eternal God, equal with the Father as God. And he gave himself on the cross for your sins and for my sins. And what he did for you is a gift. It's the greatest expression of love ever made. And he welcomes you today to invite him into your life. Maybe you would say, Pastor, I, I don't know that I've ever received Christ personally. Or I've got questions about that. I, really, I don't even know what this means. But I'm hearing you talk about it, and I just kind of feel like I want to know more. That, that's great. If you would like to talk to me or someone else, I would love to meet with you sometime this week or sometime soon and share with you how you can know for sure that your sins are forgiven through the sacrifice of Christ. And then maybe if that's you and you'd raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. Or, Pastor, I would like to meet, and I'd like to discuss that sometime. Is there anybody like that? I don't know Christ, but I'd sure like to know more about him and what he can do for me. I don't see any hands, but I'd encourage you, if that was speaking to you, come and talk to me afterwards. Let me speak to God's people here. I keep bringing this invitation constantly, but this is where we need to go. Do you Let's be specific. Do you want to come to the end of your life and know you were faithful to church and that's it? But you didn't influence anybody. Or your influence was so small because you weren't intentional with it. Or do you want to come to the end of your life and know, God, thank you. There's that one and that one. And, and you name them. You know them. And they would name you. If someone would ask, who is the person who influenced you and invested in your life? Would they name you? you would anybody name you maybe you say pastor i've never had that or it's been a while i want to be faithful in doing this i want god to use me and i want to give my life for that purpose just pray for me i, I commit my life to him I, I want god to do that in my life is there anyone like that you'd raise your hands pastor pray for me i want god to use me so that i can invest in others i want to be like abraham and eleazar's life Father, I pray for your people here. Do your work and give us, Lord, a heart to be used by you to invest in others. We just ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand. We're going to sing one final song. As we do, just...
reflect on what's been spoken and let God speak to your heart. And if you need to talk to me, I'll be in the back. I'm giving you my heart and all that is within. I lay it all down for the sake of you, my King. I'm giving you my dreams. I'm laying down my rights. I'm giving up my pride for the promise of new life. And I That's all your prayer this today. Just give him your heart and want to know him. So you guys are dismissed. Don't forget four o'clock today. If you can come hand out some uh, some of these things, that would be great. So other than that, have a good day. Have a great week. What's that? Oh, okay. If you want to be involved. We'll meet up here. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks.